Yo, what's going on snipers and welcome back to our Arizona Coyotes franchise mode here in NHL 22. So in the last episode we started up the season simulation, we also had free agency, brought in a new coach and all that stuff. And uh, we're already at December 15th and we already have fired that head coach that we hired. The reason being is because some of our team has not been producing the way that they should be. As well as some guys that I really want them to uh, match the scheme fit didn't really match the scheme fit that well. So I did offer a new head coach a job at the end of last episode. And we are probably going to be making a few changes to this team this season because we're off to a 16-11-1 and and one start which is not really that terrible. But once you get into like the player stats, it kind of gets a little bit weird because uh, this is definitely our weirdest start to a year. So as you can see with some of our forwards like Hayden and Geeky, they're producing really well because Geeky was on the power play. But I didn't have Farinacci on the power play by default. So uh, we did add him, I'm pretty sure, at the end of last episode to the power play. If not, I will have to add him there eventually. But uh, yeah, he wasn't producing that well. We go to the left wing side, we've got Agostino and Genther who've been good, Zadina's been pretty solid, same with Lawrence and LaRose, uh, but uh, yeah, basically the bottom six really hasn't put up much, but they are still doing okay. But you go to the right wing side, and this is where it gets really concerning, Sadikov only 6 goals in 28 games, 11 points isn't terrible, but only 6 goals, he's not on pace for that great of a season. But the big one, as you can see, is Calvin Shelley, only 2 goals in 28 games. For some reason, but the old head coach, uh, they didn't actually put him on the power play, and I didn't notice. Um, so, obviously, we are going to be giving him power play time once we get this new head coach in and whatnot. Uh, but with that old head coach, he didn't not really match that guy's scheme fit at all, as you could see. So, yeah, hopefully, uh, Shelly could be pretty good with the new coach, because we need Shelly to get back to his, like, heyday of scoring. Because it's been kind of going down as of late. As you can see, he had 47 goals a few years ago, 28 just last season, and only two goals in 28 games a season. So he's only on pace for like, I think like seven or eight goals maybe at most. We go to his playoff numbers as well. They've been dwindling. As you can see, he's only got four goals in his last 17 playoff games. So we really need Shelly to start stepping it up a bit. Uh, because right now that contract is looking terrible if he continues to produce this way. So we definitely need a new head coach to work well with him so he can start scoring again with that 99 shooting that he has. So, And then also a couple other guys dropped off in production a lot. And the most notable on defense is Jacob Chikern. He's only got 7 points in 28 games. He is signed for one more season at uh, 8.4. So that's looking like a little bit of a bad contract, but at least it's only one more season after this. Um, but yeah, basically his production has dropped off a cliff. Some of our young guys like Sasaki and uh, Tukinen have been pretty solid, but like I'm not really impressed with Chikern and Dobson. Hopefully they kind of step it up once we get that new head coach in and all that stuff. Goaltending's not been terrible so far, but hopefully it also improves once we get a new coach in and all that type of thing. But anyways, before we start simulating a little bit more to get in that new head coach, we do have a few comments to go over. So the first one is from Cody Legaspi. He says, I still think you should find a veteran for your team because everyone is really young now. Um, I agree with what you're saying about bringing in veterans, but at the same time, I feel like our team is kind of getting more as a veteran-based team. Because you look at Hayton, he's 29 already. You look at Genther, he's 26. Farinacci, he's 28. Um, who else is old? Not really that much old players on the forecourt. Zadina is technically old, but we will probably be trading him away in this episode uh, just to make room for a guy in the minors in Gallagher. Um, and then I also look to more of our defensive core as veteran based because we got Chicken, Dobson, and Soderstrom who are all 28 plus. Also, I guess Hind Ola now since we brought him in in last episode. But yeah, I think our team does actually have a solid mix of veterans, but we could always add more if there is actually a use for them. But I think in today's episode, we probably won't bring in a veteran, but obviously I'm only going to be simming up to like the trade deadline in this episode. So in next episode, we could probably uh, trade for a veteran to help us out if we really need to. Because like when I was looking at the block, there wasn't really anything intriguing because once we trade away Zadina, basically this left-hand side becomes a lot weaker. The only veteran left winger that I saw that was interesting was Panarin, and I don't really know how he fits with this team. Um, so he could be something we could trade for at the trade deadline if we know for a fact that he actually matches with our new head coach that we get in. 
And our final comment is from Hawksvein88. He says, I think trading Zadina would be a good idea in order to get Gallagher into the lineup. You should look in getting picks and or prospects for him. A few players I thought were interesting that you could go after were Gleason and Connor on Colorado, Redmond on Dallas, and Duffy on St. Louis, a 19-year-old medium elite playmaker. He might be a little riskier to go after though since he's only a 63 overall. So um, yeah, we're definitely going to look into uh, getting rid of Zadina. I did actually look at those three offers that he was mentioning about and I do have one that works better than the others. Um, so we will get into that once we uh, once we get, uh, yeah, we can do this actually before we get the coach, I think. Yeah, we'll do that before we get the coach in, but we are going to be flipping away Zadina because even though he's been probably one of our best players so far this season, he's still not been really worth his money. He's also a terrible fit with the current coach, but I don't know how he's going to fit with the new coach that we get in. And he is signed to $9 million, which is the highest price point on this entire team. And he's definitely not worth that $9 million. Also, because I want to test out LaRose with Shelly, because LaRose has really good playmaking skills. So that's why Zadina is getting kind of pushed out of the team. And we were going to eventually trade him away at some point anyways, so kind of makes sense to do it now. So let's get into making that trade. So I did write down all those players that Hawks fan was mentioning. So he was mentioning Gleason and Connor in Colorado. I will show you guys that uh, kind of deal first. So let's put uh, Zadina onto our trade here. So as you can see, zadina has got a pretty decent chunk of trade value and he's got two years left. So um, yeah, decent there. And we should be able to fetch something pretty good for him, considering that value is pretty solid. We go to first to Colorado, and now Colorado actually has interest in him. The only problem with Colorado is their $5 million over the cap space if we uh, try and make a trade with them. Like, uh, we can't take back both those prospects, because, or else we'd be over the player limit, so I'd only be able to take back one, and I'd have to like retain salary or something like that and take back somebody that's kind of making like a decent chunk of money so it's not really worth it to trade for Connor or Gleason even though both those guys are pretty solid players because if we actually look at Connor for example he's a 77 at 20 he's actually in their lineup already um, but yeah this guy was a former 28th overall pick he kind of has weird attributes but yeah this guy could be a pretty solid player uh, but unfortunately we just because of the cap situation we can't really trade for him and then he was also mentioning Gleason who is not a left winger. Let me go to the skaters matching block. He's a centerman, 75 at 20, but he does actually have better all-around stats than the other guys. So this guy would be probably the better of the two to trade for, even though he's a lower overall at the same age. Uh, but once again, like I said, the salary issue with this team, it makes it impossible to kind of trade with Colorado for one of them too. So we aren't going to be trading Zadina to Colorado. Now we will check St. Louis because the Dallas one is the one we're going to be making. But uh, St. Louis is also one where it would be intriguing to trade for that medium elite uh, that uh, Hawksman was mentioning in Duffy. The only problem is he's 63 at 19, so he might not develop that well. And also the fact that his trade value is more than Zadina's, and also they'd be over salary cap. is So uh, it doesn't really work with St. Louis as well that much, so we cannot make a trade for Duffy, unfortunately. So the one for Dallas is probably the best bet, and it actually does work cap-wise. Uh, they're 8, 15, and 3, which I don't know why they're trying to trade for Zadina, but uh, it's beyond me. So we are going to be trading for this Redmond guy in Dallas that he was mentioning. 77 at 20 years of age, just signed to his ELC. He's also playing in the NHL right now. I honestly don't know why, um, but uh, he hasn't really got much ice time and whatnot. Like I would probably send him down to Texas and uh, let him play down there and basically replace Gallagher in the minors. So that's pretty much what we're going to be doing is bringing in this guy because he does have, like I said, some pretty good attributes all around, more of a shooter than the passer and has decent offensive awareness and whatnot. So uh, we are going to be bringing in Redmond as the first piece of this deal. And then we are also going to try and get back a little bit more because as you can see, the value is heavy in their favor or in our favor, I should say, or in their favor, actually, yeah. Um, so if we look at draft picks, they do want to move their seconds. They actually have a lot of picks on the block. I don't know why they want to get rid of everything, but apparently they do, except for their first rounder. So we will take back a second round pick, and as you can see, that kind of looks like it might work. So we will try that first, but if it doesn't work, we do have picks that we could add to this deal going back to Dallas, because as you can see, we have two picks in every single round pretty much, except for the sixth round and the first round. So... 
Um, yeah, if we can get away with not adding any picks to this, then we'll have two second rounders as well to add to this. So we're kind of stocking up for this year's draft, which I don't really know if it's a good thing to do. Uh, but we will try it anyways. So let's see if this goes through. And if it doesn't, then like I said, we could always add in like a fifth rounder to get this to go through. Okay, so let's see if this deal will go through. And like I said, if it doesn't, we'll just add in another pick and it should work. So Zadina for Redmond and a second round pick. And that's accepted. Okay, so there's a pretty good deal, I think. We free up a lot of cap space, and now we could actually call up Gallagher from the AHL, which I'm really excited about because he's an 81 overall low elite player that we signed that went undrafted. Look at his attributes. He's a really good shooter, really good offensive awareness, really good defensive awareness as well. So should be interesting to see how this guy does in the NHL. So we're going to call him up. And over to player limits. So we are going to have to send down the guy we just traded for in Redmond. And yeah, basically Redmond will be going to the top line where Gallagher was in the AHL. And yeah, that AHL team is pretty damn stacked. So I am going to move Lawrence up to the third line. And I am going to be throwing in our boy Gallagher on that fourth line. We actually have a lot of snipers on this team. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, let's go to special teams. And we will also give, I think, Gallagher some power play time because why not? Actually, is Farinacci on the power play yet? Yeah, he is. Okay. So, let's go to right wingers, and yeah, we'll give Gallagher some power play time. Why not? Because we need to just kind of have our line set up in uh, for now, and then once we get our new head coach, we could kind of adjust the lines to be better chemistry-wise and whatnot. And then AHL-wise, like I said, we will throw Redmond into the top line, and he should be in the NHL by next season, I would assume, at this rate. So, that is great news. Because if he gets some good growth this year, which he more than likely he will with how good this team is, I'm going to be very excited to see what he could do. Um, let's just put him here. I don't really care of how the power play lines are set up in the AHL. But yeah, that AHL team is actually insane. Like, it might be my best AHL team ever. Like, there's a lot of guys that could almost be in the NHL at this point. Uh, let's go to extra teams, get him in on there as well. And that should be good. Yep, that is good. Perfect. So as you can see, the HL team is absolutely nuts. And hopefully we can get guys like Baikov, Redmond, maybe like Dalmo. Uh, there's also a Nisimov who should be up, but I don't know if I'll be bringing him back at some point. Then my own Ladipov are also really close to being an NHL ready. Same with Guerrero and Ortmeier. Osgood's getting growth. And same with Rabbit. But anyways, those were the trades we're going to make in this episode, but we might make some more in the next episode. So... Now that we've traded Zadino away to the Dallas Stars, we do have actually a lot of cap space as well, which is kind of nice because it gives it a little bit more flexibility going into the offseason. But uh, let's advance a few days and see if we get that head coach in. And then we will adjust our lines with this new coach. And then we'll simulate probably up to a day before the deadline so we can kind of see what kind of moves we could potentially make for the rest of the season. So let's uh, advance like three days and the coach should accept, I would assume. Unless he doesn't like our market. There's a 5-4 win and he does decline. So I'm going to just offer him a new contract again. But we did win our first game since making that change. <clears throat> we did win our first game since making that change. Sorry, I had to make a cut again because my throat is dying on me. Chicken was also injured, which is not great. But uh, at least we got a win with the new head coach right away. Or well, the old head coach. Actually, it was the assistant coach at one point. But we need to offer that coach a contract again. That climby guy. Because we need a new coach for this team so we could actually be a good team. Um, so, Climby, we are going to sign you again. And you are going to be our head coach. And, yeah, we'll just give you what you're asking for. He wants 958, which we don't really have a lot of money for. So, we might actually have to fire, like, an associate coach in the AHL or some shit. I don't even know. So, we'll try and see if he accepts that. Advance a few more days. He should accept because, I mean, he does not like our team's market. Yeah, I'm going to offer him more money. I think I could still afford more money, even though it says we only have 958. I think I could still afford more. At least I hope I can because if I can't, then this might be a little bit problematic. So we'll go back to head coach. Let's talk him up a little bit and see if that will help. But yeah, hopefully this team could uh, continue assimilating decently because we're winning games. It's just more about getting our guys going like Shelly and stuff that I'm worried about. Stop rejecting Khalil. Jeez. Okay, we got to get him. 
If I can't get uh, Khalil Klimi, I might have to look for somebody else, but Klimi is probably the best option, to be honest, for this team. Let's talk him up. Let's give him a little bit over a million as the head coach, since I think we should be able to still afford it. If we can't, for some reason, I might have to fire a coach in the minors randomly. I don't know. And Shikern is back. That is good news, because I need Shikern to start getting going a bit on that uh, defensive core. Because, uh, yeah, he was off to a little bit of a sluggish start so far. A few more days. And Kalimi is still rejecting. Are you kidding me, Khalil? You literally have, like, no job and it's halfway through the season, man. We need you as our head coach. <laughs> I don't know why he's rejecting so much. Because you think if he didn't have a job, he'd be, like, eager to get into uh, a coaching job. But apparently not. He must be, like, coaching some kids or something right now. Okay, Klimi, are you going to accept? Let's reject that because I don't care about any offers right now. And there you go. He's accepted. So we got ourselves our head coach, and now we can actually make some line adjustments. But we are now 19-12-2, so we are doing still pretty decently. Now it's all about seeing how this new coach works with this team. So how does Shelly work with this new coach? It's a lot better on that second line. Okay, that's exactly what I wanted to see. The lines actually look pretty good already. We might not need to make any line changes. Yeah, I think I'm going to keep the lines the exact same the way they are right now. Defense also looks a lot better with this new coach, which is kind of interesting. But uh, Chikrin and uh, Soderstrom, which worked for a lot of other coaches, does not work anymore. So that's interesting. Uh, goalies obviously will stay the same. How about our special teams? How's that chemistry? And not great, but I mean, it is what it is. I'll still take it. Uh, power play number two should probably get a little bit of work. Uh, I guess we could leave it with a minus one, minus one. Yeah, I don't really like that power play chemistry. But, I mean, it is what it is. Penalty kill looks actually pretty good, so I'll keep the penalty kill the way it is. But I think with this new coach, our team definitely looks a lot better. And hopefully we could simulate a lot better as well. So that is good. Let me just make sure he's the head coach and it's still not the random interim. Okay, that's good. Okay, let's uh, actually do some calendar simming as we get closer to the trade deadline and see if this team wins more games. And hopefully, like I said, Shelly can find his goal-scoring touch because we need him to get going. Because like I said, he's been pretty flat as of late. So, uh, But we're not going to be making any trades up until the trade deadline. But at the trade deadline, like I said, we could make some trades this year. We do win our first game with the new head coach for nothing. I really like that. Good offense and good defense. I'm really excited to see what Sasaki could do the rest of the year because he's been pretty good defensively. Um, and there's our first loss with the new coach, but we were on a three-game winning streak as Hayden has now been injured. The only problem this year is we've been running into a lot of injury troubles, um, but uh, hopefully the depth forwards could kind of help out a little bit. And now Shelly's been injured with an injured stomach. That's not good because I want him to get going. This is definitely going to be his worst year yet, I think, because of those injuries and whatnot. But, yeah, so far not too bad with the new coach, I think. We'll definitely have to take a look at how he's done with us so far. So, Schulz is going to get taken out of the lineup. And we'll throw back in Shelly since he's returned. And Hayton is still out. Hopefully, he returns soon. As he returns almost like the next day. <laughs> Takes Sopolviov out. Throw back in Barrett Hayton. And we are good to go. But yeah, this team is still simulating good, which is nice to see. It was just kind of a weird start with, like, our top guns not scoring as much as they really should. Like, that kind of concerned me, especially going towards the playoffs and whatnot, right? So we wanted to make sure we had the right coach for the job. We're now 29-18-2, so pretty good start. Let's continue to simulate up until a day before the deadline. We do have a lot of good prospects in our system, but we could trade away for veterans if we really want to. Um, so there's always a chance like we could move out like Bicob for example or whatnot if we want to bring in somebody like because we're getting offered like these DeMaio, Popovic, and Dollywall trades for like Kyle Kernkovic so those type of things we might be willing to do so we'll have to take a look at what is available at the end of the simulation portion and see if there's anything that we could actually bring in to make this team even better but I don't really want to be sitting a lot of the young guys that's the only problem because if we sit any of those uh, young guys, then they're going to lose morale and not grow as much as we should. Uh, let's continue to simulate. Actually, let me stop the sim because I can't see where we are. And we're kind of losing a little bit more games this month, but 
we are still in an okay spot, I think. Let's just go right to the fifth. But yeah, this team might still need to kind of figure out some kinks going into the playoffs. There we go. So 35-22-4 has us in the first wildcard spot, which I'll take Agostino's point per game. You'd love to see that. Um, in terms of the Western Conference, Dam, if we were in the Pacific Division, we'd be first in the Pacific. But since we're in the Central, we're literally just barely in a playoff spot. I mean, the Predators are kind of far are back of us, but that's kind of ridiculous when you think about it. So the Central Division is pretty stacked. The Wild, the Avalanche, and the Jets all above us. But 59 points in 59 games is pretty good for Agostino. Okay, so let's take a look at our team stats again so far this season just to see if the new coach has helped out at all. Because I don't remember what the stat line was from the old coach. But we are currently 8th best in the league, so we got better as the season's gone on so far. Goals for per game wise, looks like our offense is still not great. Uh, 3.08 is still around mid table. I think it might have improved, but we definitely need our offense to score more goals than that. Goals against wise, though, we are one of the best defensive teams in the NHL, but it kind of by a large margin, the Minnesota Wild is a lot better. Uh, but still, really good to see that we're a good defensive team. Uh, power play percentage 20%. That's actually pretty good considering the chemistry is not really that great. That is one of the best in the NHL. It looks like top 15, if I'm not mistaken. Our penalty kill at 83% is not terrible, but it is not one of the best. It's mid-table around as well, almost. So special teams are not terrible, and an offense is pretty much in 5-on-5 five five wise needs to improve a bit. Uh, penalty kill is okay. Um, short handed goals this season so far, we only have four, which is kind of mid table, I guess. Home record wise, where are we in terms of our home record? We are 17 12 and 2, and then 18 10 and 2 on the road. 4 4 and 2 in our last 10 games. I don't really like that. So hopefully, we can kind of pick that up after the trade deadline. Let's take a look at these player stats so far for the season. Starting off with our centerman, Heaton's got 36 points in 55 games. Not really worth the uh, cap, uh, well, the money we gave him, 6.7. Uh, but uh, obviously, we could always pick up a new center in this offseason if we really want to. Geeky, 34 points. I'll definitely take that. Since also putting Fernacci back on the power play, he's been really good. 31 points in 59 games. I'm trying to think about how much he had before. I think he had 10 points in 28 games, which means over the last 31 games, he's put up like 21 points, if I'm not mistaken. So he's been pretty good. We go to left wingers. Agostino's still been really good. I really love Agostino. He might be one of my favorite players in this series because he's just been really good defensively, solid penalty killer as well, everything like that. Genther, 40 points, pretty solid. Leroux's 38 points, so it looks like since putting him next to Shelly, he has picked up more assists. We got to take a look at Shelly's stat line, obviously, after this. But uh, right now, it seems like he could be a good setup man for Shelly, for sure. Uh, Lawrence, 27 points. Shishkinov, 17 points. McGill, 16 points. And Schulz, one goal. I think our offense is looking pretty good in terms of depth scoring so far. And Shelly's got 28 points, only 10 goals in 59 games. So that means over the last 31 games, he's only picked up 8 goals. So he is scoring more than he was at the beginning of the year, but still, this is a really rough year for Calvin Shelley. Now, the thing is, he is listed as a third-line scoring forward, which means most of his growth right now, that 85, it actually might be like an 82-83. So giving him like $7 million might not be a great thing. But hopefully he could kind of bounce back because I he's not a hugely great fit with this coach, but he is the best fit he's ever been with a coach. So it's really hard to find a coach that actually works really well with him. But uh, yeah, and apparently Clemmy's an unfavored coach of his. He liked Lang the best, which is kind of weird. Um, Sadikov, 27 points, but at least Shelley's passed him in points and whatnot. But Shelley needs to score more goals than pick up assists, in my opinion. Uh, Gallagher, 9 points since getting called up. Not bad. 81 overall still. Only a minus 1 for a sniper is not bad either. He is getting power play time, so I don't know if he should be on the power play or what, considering his production. But a good amount of takeaways as well from him. So I'm not too... I'm not uh, impressed really with Gallagher, but I'm not mad at him either. We go to defense. Soderstrom's been good. Chikrin has been phenomenal since getting his new coach, I think. Because he had 8 points in 28 games, and now he's up to 33 and 60. 
So this new coach has definitely helped him out. Uh, Sasaki has really fallen off a bit. He has 14 points, but he's a minus 7 now. He was like a plus 4, I believe, when we started this episode. But his shooting percentage is 7.5, which is pretty good for a defenseman, especially a defensive defenseman. But, uh, yeah, Sasaki's kind of not great. We might need to change up that top six pairing. He's had 71 hits already this year, 75 block shots, and that's within 61 games. So he blocks over a shot a game and throws over a hit a game. I know it was a minus 10. <clears throat> so, yeah, that Hainola and Sasaki pairing isn't really working plus minus wise, but who knows, maybe in the playoffs it will be a lot better. Dobson still hasn't been really that great, but he's now at plus 5, so he definitely has improved a bit. But uh, so far, not great from him. And then Tukinen's really slowed down, but a plus 14, I'd love to see that. So, I think our defensive core is still putting up a decent amount of points, but uh, some of the guys are getting caught out there a lot longer than they should be. And in goalie-wise, so far, Pedersen's still been pretty good. And Hunter Jones has been a phenomenal backup so far with a 916 and a 267, so... Not too bad from the goaltending. And also the fact Pedersen actually has three shadows already. Pretty good. I'll definitely take that. So those are our player stats with the new coach. How has the new coach actually done for us so far in terms of wins and losses and all that? Before we take a look at the trading block. Has he uh, helped us out or not? Hopefully he has. I believe this is his first NHL coaching job. Yep, 16-10-2. and two. Not bad. Not great, but 60% winning. And he's never coached anybody before but us, so that's kind of interesting. But 68% uh, scheme fit. Not a great fit with, like, Lawrence and stuff like that, but uh, kind of balanced a decent scheme fit for about the most of our lineup. So we could always replace him at some point, but he's decent enough for now. Okay, so that is that. Now let's take a look at... Uh, actually, let me take a quick look at the AHL stats. Because I don't normally do this in the middle of the season, but I kind of want to take a quick look at who's been doing what in the AHL. So let's just go forward. So how has been great? Yeah, pretty much as you would expect with a stacked AHL team. A lot of points, a lot of good plus minus, all that type of thing. Since we brought in Redmond, he's also been pretty good down there. 21 points in 32 games, plus 15. He is up to a 79 now. So he's getting more development playing in the AHL than he was in the NHL with Dallas. Uh, defensively, Ortmeier's insane. Sucks that he's not making it to the NHL because he has an X factor. But 43 points in 63 games. Ladipov is getting close, as I was mentioning. Same with DeMaio. Same with Guerrero, who's literally almost an NHL defenseman. We could always call up Guerrero for the playoffs. That'd be interesting. He's a plus 31 this year in the AHL, though. Rabbit's getting some growth, I think. Same with Osgood. And the goalie situation down there has been amazing. Holy crap. Both goalies have almost a 9.30 save percentage. Like, uh, Nicholas Hornquist, this 7th round pick, is getting really close to being NHL ready. So, uh, yeah, that AHL team is absolutely insane. No points from the goalies, but very good stat line. That AHL team is probably going to get knocked out in the first round because of that, but they are simulating really good, and that's good for our prospect development for sure. Now let's take a look at the trading block. Just in case we want to make any trades in next episode. And I'll also, I think, show you guys maybe some progress reports already. And then that will be it for this episode. But we might make some trades next episode just to kind of help us out. Oh yeah, I went to the draft class by mistake. I don't know why I went there. But let me just take a look actually at the draft class right now just for fun. And it doesn't look like the greatest draft because there's top nines potentially going late first round. So... We have a lot of picks this year's draft, but are we going to be getting anything good? I really don't know. Okay, so trading block-wise, Mason Appleton's still on the block like he was before. Simon Holmstrom's now on the block. Uh, Benoit Olivier Gruel is a left-winger and a veteran. And does fit our top six. Hmm. But I don't really know where I would fit him in. Like, I could move LaRose down to the third line. And then eventually we'd have to scratch somebody, obviously, in our lineup that's kind of young. But uh, B.O. Gruel... Might be an okay guy to bring in, but we'd have to get rid of a roster player in the AHL or something to get uh, get him in because we do have, I believe, the maximum amount of salaries that we could sign. Uh, there's also <clears throat> <clears throat> there's also Gage Gun Calvez, who's not too bad. Really cheap contract, but signed for one year, only two-way deal. 
Not a bad player, but I really don't know where I would slot him in, to be honest. Uh, Miles Wood is still there. Same with Taro Hirose and Michael Dalcole. Not really interested in any of those guys. Panarin's still there. He's dropping off a little bit since I last looked. His value's still kind of high, though, for a guy that's that age and could retire. But it's probably because he has 62 points in 64 games. Hmm. The question is, do we try and trade for Panarin? He doesn't match our coach, though. That's the only thing. He would be a good left-wing fit because we don't have the strongest left-wing core, but we could try and trade for him if we really want to. But like I said, the new coach, he doesn't work well with them. Um, Mackenzie Blackwood, interesting. Still Gleason and Connor, not that we need them. Uh, Matt Murray, Sonny Milano, Emil Bemstrom. Not really anything intriguing there. Uh, Dallas, just more prospects. Two Holloways. That's kind of interesting. Abel Holloway and who's this Holloway? Mauricio Holloway. And they drafted both of them. It's kind of funny. Detroit has Strom, Frost, Kupari, and Gruden. Yeah, there's not really anything on the left wing side a lot on the block, but there is some good veterans out there, like Cody was mentioning, that we could always bring in a vet. Uh, D'Angelo, Anderson, Alexiak, and I don't really need defensemen. Braden Schneider's dropping, probably due to morale. He's probably not having a fun time over there in L.A., our former defenseman. Minnesota, Foodie, Erickson, Eck, Blay, Nick Paul, and Bastion. Oh, so those guys are like fourth liners, so not really that great. Um, nothing really in Montreal. Uh, what's his first name again? I always forget it. Jacob Larson. I almost said Johan Larson. But uh, Jacob Larson, Adam Pellick, uh, Wyatt Kalianuk. Not really anything there, just defense mainly. Uh, Gasperi Kapan on two years left at 10.5. No, thank you. <laughs> That's a bit pricey. Uh, Forslane, Riley, Mikheyev. Mikheyev's not bad for one year, but he is dropping off a lot. He's more than likely going to retire. And he isn't really the greatest offensive forward. So, uh, Hammerlick, okay. Nothing really in Ottawa. Kyle Kernkovic, oh, he is a left winger. We were getting offered trades for him, but we'd have to give up some top-notch prospects to get him. Does fit all forward lines and our penalty kill. So Kyle Kernkovic might be the most intriguing piece. 37 points through 62 games. Career high was a 48-point season. Yeah, maybe we do try and trade for Kyle Kernkovic for that left-wing side, but then, we'd, like I said, we'd have to scratch probably somebody like uh, Shishkinov or even McGillis or something. I don't really know. But uh, Kernkovic on one year left at 2.8 is not too bad for an 85. He'd be purely a rental, but he would probably be a good option. So there's definitely that. I'll look afterwards and see what it would take to get somebody like him. There's Domko Balik, but three years left I don't like. Nothing really in St. Louis. No need a goalie. Nothing really in Toronto. Uh, Pool RV, but two years left. Uh, Faraby, but three years. Carlo, one year left. And Mario Ferraro. Brennan Gallagher, two years left. No, thank you. Dylan Dubé on one year left, but 6.4 is a bit expensive. Some decent players there. Velarde, Morrissey, Pionk. All have term. Barrett Pessy and Josh Brook. So I think the most intriguing piece is definitely... Where was he again? Uh, was what team? Oh yeah, Kyle Krinkovic on the Flyers. So let's do one last thing before we end this episode and just take a look at the fine trade option and just see what it would take to get somebody like Kyle Krinkovic because I think he might be the best option for this team. It would take Baikov, Galiev, and Cuff. Or it would take DeMaio, um, our fifth round pick, and Cuff. Or Ladipov is second in the seventh. So Ladipov... Was a former first rounder. He's a 78 overall top four prospect, but he's like 23, 22. And then we'd have to give up also a second round pick, which is not terrible, and a seventh. That one's not bad, but Ladipov might eventually get in our way into our defensive core, but he might not pan out to be in a top four. So that might not be a bad offer. DeMaio being a 78 and only like 20 years old, I'd rather probably hold on to him, but he is an NHL ready defenseman almost in a fifth rounder. And some guy that's probably not going to make it. And then there's this one where Bykov's like 22, I think, in top 6 potential. Already like a 78 overall. And then there's Galiev, who we drafted, I think, a few years ago. He was actually close to being NHL already, wasn't he? I think. And then Cuff, who's not going to make it. 
Let me take a look at these trade offers a little bit more in depth. I know this might be a little bit of a long episode, but it is what it is. Um, so, Baikov, yeah, he's 22-78. He has some decent attributes. Was a former first-round pick. He'd probably be a good bottom six player to keep. Uh, but there's that. Galiev, who is probably close to being in the AHL. I think he was a 71 when we drafted him, though. And then just uh, randomly Nelson Cuff. I don't really know about that one. And then the other ones were not as intriguing, I guess. Or, well, the other ones were kind of intriguing. So, I think if we are going to be making a deal, Kalakrinkovic is the one we'd be doing. But I really want to make sure we give up the right amount of players for him. So, it's, I'd, I'd say this one's not a bad one to do, considering Baikov might not pan out. But I'm kind of worried about giving up Galiev. And then we have the second offer, which DeMaio, I don't really want to give him up. And then there's this one, which kind of makes sense, but we'd have to give up a second rounder instead of a fifth. So anyways, guys, let me know what you guys think about these trade, and we will maybe make it in next episode. Or if there was something else you guys saw on the block, we could potentially trade for that instead. So yeah, let me know what you guys think down below, and I'll see you guys next time.